And the man responsible for coining the terms positive and negative to identify the different types of electric fields was Benjamin Franklin. And on this video produced by David Roberts on his Quantum Boffin website, he shows one of the experiments that Franklin did to help identify negative and positive charges. Here we see Roberts rubbing two glass rods with a piece of silk. And as he puts the rods near each other, you see that they repel one another. Rubbing the rods actually created a force field in the rods which makes them repel. When Roberts rubbed a rubber rod, Franklin used a hard rubber rod with no sulfur in it, he discovered exactly the same thing happened by taking two hard rubber rods and rubbing them with the same material as the glass rods, they also repelled. So Franklin knew that by using friction with certain materials, Franklin actually used uh, cat's fur, that force fields were built up in these rods. But the interesting thing that Franklin noticed is that when he rubbed a glass rod and a rubber rod and put them near each other, they didn't repel, but they attracted one another, as seen here. This is a very interesting phenomenon. And even more interesting is that Franklin discovered that the material that was doing the rubbing, in this case a silk cloth, actually took on the opposite force field of the material it was rubbing. Notice this. When he puts the cloth near the glass rod after rubbing it, it attracts just like the hard rubber rod did. This made Franklin believe that some sort of what he imagined to be a fluid was being transferred between the object being rubbed and the object doing the rubbing. Now, for reasons that no one really knows, Franklin assumed that the glass rod was somehow absorbing this electric fluid from the cloth. And so he called the charge on the glass rod positive, and he assumed that the rubber rod was losing fluid to the cloth, and so he called it negative. And the rule then became when two positive charges are put near each other, they repel. The same is true for two negatives. They repel. That is, like charges repel. Whereas if two opposite charged objects get near each other, they will attract. Now, because Franklin was such a prolific writer, his definition of positive and negative became the accepted norm. And that means we can now determine when something is charged, whether it's negative or positive, based on Benjamin Franklin's definition. And the entire scientific community took these definitions on, and they still exist today. So here's how Benjamin Franklin's definitions are used to determine the charge on any given object. It turns out that if you put a piece of scotch tape on a shiny surface and rip it off like this, it takes on a charge. And we can determine that charge by using Benjamin Franklin's definition. We charge up a hard rubber rod, which makes it negative, as Benjamin Franklin defined, and look, the tape is attracted to the hard rubber rod. That makes the tape positive, since unlike charges attract. To confirm this, we charge up a glass rod and hold it up to the tape, and we find that the positive glass rod repels the tape. That means that for sure, the tape is charged positively since like charges repel. Now, if we take a piece of styrofoam and rub it, we find that the styrofoam takes on a negative charge. Don't forget, the tape is positive and attracts to the styrofoam, so the styrofoam is negative. Now, if we take a, an aluminum pie plate and place it on top of the negative styrofoam and touch it, a spark can be heard, although it's not audible in the video. But interestingly, when the pie plate is put near the tape, we find that the pie plate turns positive after touching it on the negative styrofoam. You see it's positive here because the tape is repelled and the tape is positive. Now, although this demonstration, as well as the others, were poorly understood in the late 1700s by scientists, these demonstrations did nevertheless serve as a foundation for the building of a model, an accurate model, that explained the nature of the atom much more clearly and also explained how and why atoms combine to form molecules. And one of the most important experiments done to show the connection between electricity and atoms
was the experiment we showed you in an earlier video in which we placed positive and negative electrodes in water and witnessed the separation of the molecule of water into its constituent atoms. Oxygen was attracted to the positive pole shown on the left here, and hydrogen was attracted to the negative pole. That implied to scientists that oxygen must have a negative charge since it was attracted to positive, and hydrogen must have a positive charge since it was attracted to the negative pole. This gave chemists the idea that elements had to be either negative or positive in order to attract one another to form molecules. In fact, after the periodic table was discovered, or invented, depending on your point of view, it was noticed that elements on the extreme left-hand side of the chart always tended to be positive when they formed molecules, while those on the right-hand side, excluding the last column of inert gases, those on the right-hand side always tended to be negative when they formed molecules. Now, this idea had a huge element of truth to it, but a lot of details were missing. And those details were not uncovered until 1900, when this man, J.J. Thompson, discovered the source for the negative charge in atoms. And he called that source the electron. And in the next video, we will show you the experiment that he set up to make this. At the end of our last video lesson, we showed you a picture of this man, J.J. Thompson, and told you that he was the one responsible for discovering the source of the negative charge that was identified by Benjamin Franklin many years earlier. Thompson did his work around 1900 using this tube shown here called the cathode ray tube. We found it very beneficial to explain the history of the invention of this tube to better understand how Thompson did his work. To begin our story, we're going to start with a man named Luigi Galvani. He was an Italian who did his experiments in the late 1700s about the same time that Lavoisier did. Galvini was experimenting with, with frog muscles to try to determine what was causing the muscle to contract. And one day in the lab, he accidentally got it to twitch when the brass hook that was hanging the muscle touched a metal iron scalpel while the scalpel was touching the muscle. It caused the muscle to twitch. And he thought somehow the electricity was flowing through the metal, but the electricity was coming from the frog's leg itself. But a friend of his named Alessandro Volta seemed to have a different idea. He thought it was the metals themselves that were touching, causing the electricity that went through the muscle leg. Volta conducted an experiment in which he replaced muscle with tissue paper that was soaked in salt water. And he sandwiched the tissue paper between two pieces of dissimilar metal. He used copper and zinc. And when we take the tissue paper and dip it in salt water and sandwich it between the two dissimilar metals, we find that it produced electricity. Watch this. Placing the zinc on top of the tissue paper, which is on top of the copper, and the, taking the electrodes from the meter, we discover that almost three quarters of a volt is produced. This combination of copper, salt, tissue paper, and zinc was called an electrochemical cell by Volta. Even more interesting, however, is when another cell is built on top of the first one, again with copper, tissue paper, and zinc, we find that the voltage actually doubles. Look at that. It goes over a volt, almost a volt and a half. So that means that by adding layers of these electrochemical cells, we can create increasing amounts of voltage. And that's exactly what they did in the early 1800s with batteries that look something like this, consisting of layers of electrochemical cells placed on top of one another. High voltages then could be created that produced continuous currents that were not possible before this invention. And this man, Humphrey Davy, the same guy who discovered sodium back in the early 1800s, actually built a battery with enough cells to produce over 2,000 volts.
and he used these strong batteries to conduct many experiments, some of which discovered other elements, but this one in particular is one in which he placed two carbon rods very near each other and connected one to the positive and the other to the negative pole of the battery. And that produced an amazing spark in the space between the carbon rods as shown here. The light from the carbon arc was so intense that it was actually able to be used as artificial light. In fact, some European cities used the carbon arc lamps as street lights up until the 1960s. But creating sparks with carbon rods was just the beginning. Throughout the entire 19th century, scientists experimented with ever increasing voltages and discovered that they can create longer and longer sparks in longer tubes. And they didn't have to use carbon as electrodes. They used different types of metals. The tube shown here, invented in the mid-1800s, was special because it had almost all of the air sucked out of it with a vacuum pump. And the man who invented it, Heinrich Geisler, discovered by pumping out most of the air and putting a very high voltage across the electrodes on either end of the tube, that the remaining air started to glow. He also discovered that by replacing the air with a pure gas such as neon or argon, that different colored lights could be created. This really was the first neon bulb ever invented. And it's the precursor to neon signs that we see in commercial use today. Now keep in mind that Geisler could only get the gases in these tubes to glow when they were under very low pressure. In other words, he used a vacuum pump to suck all of the air or most of the air out and when he added new gases he only added a small amount so that the pressure inside the tube was very low and it was taken a step further by this man a man named William Crooks who with better pumps was able to produce even lower pressures and in doing so he discovered that the glow started to disappear and the more he pumped the gas out the darker the tube became starting from the cathode, the negative electrode, and working its way to the positive electrode until there was no more glow at all. But he did notice something very interesting. He noticed that even though there was no gas glowing in the tube, the very end of the tube glowed, which indicated to him that something was striking the end of the glass tube opposite from the cathode. It became apparent to Crookes that some sort of a beam was being emitted from the cathode, the negative electrode at the far end of the tube seen here, and was being attracted to the anode, the positive electrode. And the beam was picking up so much speed that it went right past the positive electrode and struck the glass wall, making it glow. In this picture, we see that a cross was attached to the positive electrode and the beams actually cast a shadow at the end of the glass tube. The sharp edges of the shadow indicate that the beam is traveling in a straight line. Throughout the latter part of the 19th century, several major refinements were made to the Crookes tube. Shown here, the anode was moved closer to the cathode, and it included a hole, which allowed the cathode rays to pass right through it, striking the glass on the right-hand side. Now, because the end of the tube was coated with a fluorescent substance, a very intense small bright spot appeared right where the cathode rays struck the end of the tube. It was very small because it was focused by the hole in the anode. So now, even though the beam itself was invisible, its location could be determined precisely by determining where the bright spot was located at the end of the tube. And it was using equipment like this that J.J. Thompson did his experiments. And one of the first experiments he did was to confirm that the beam was negatively charged. As you can see here, Thompson placed negative and positive electrodes, positive on top and negative on the bottom of the glass cathode ray tube. And when he turned on the voltage on the electrodes, the beam deflected up towards the positive electrode. And since he knew that opposite charges attracted, he was certain that the beam was negative. But this was just the beginning. Thompson spent years measuring how much the beam deflected as he changed the voltage across the top and bottom electrodes. He also experimented with different intensities of the beam. 
And using new information discovered by scientists named Faraday and Maxwell about the relationship between magnetism and electricity, Thompson concluded that the negative charges were being carried by tiny little particles he called electrons that were embedded inside the atom and that he, with high voltages, was able to knock these little negative particles off of the atom and send them streaming through the cathode ray tube. He thus changed Dalton's model of the atom from being indestructible to being made up of subatomic particles embedded in a very solid positive mass, as shown here. He called this the plum pudding model because he envisioned the atom to be something like a plum pudding where there was cake, which is the positive part of the atom, he assumed, and little negative plums evenly dispersed throughout it, much of which was accurate. However, there were many problems with Thompson's model. First of all, it turned out that the mass of the electron was almost 2,000 times lighter than a hydrogen atom, rather than the 1,000 times lighter that he estimated it to be. Secondly, it turns out that the positive part of the atom didn't take up very much space as he thought it did. In fact, it turns out that the positive part of the atom is concentrated in a very, very tiny center. And in the next video, we'll show you how that discovery was made. Ernest Rutherford discovered that the positive part of the atom was concentrated in the very center in an unimaginably small space. And he also discovered that the positive part of the atom was made up of particles that he called protons. Most chemistry textbooks explain that the nucleus of the atom was discovered by Rutherford by using what they call the gold foil experiment in which he bombarded a thin piece of gold foil with alpha particles. And while most textbooks do make reference to the gold foil experiment, very few of them explain exactly where alpha particles come from, or how Rutherford discovered them, or why he would bother to bombard gold foil with streams of these particles. A good place to start the story of the discovery of the nucleus of the atom is 1895, because that's the year that Rutherford received a scholarship from New Zealand to do research in any university in the world that would accept him. And Rutherford chose the Cavendish Lab at Cambridge University in England, where J.J. Thompson was doing his work that led to the discovery of the electron. It didn't take long for J.J. Thompson to realize that Rutherford was an extraordinary researcher, so he took him under his wing and gave him a laboratory to work in. In the same year that Rutherford was setting up his research, two very important discoveries were made which attracted Rutherford's attention and directed his research. The first was a discovery by a man named Wilhelm Rentgen that very strange radiation seemed to emanate from cathode ray tubes that were put under very high voltages. He noticed that a screen that was covered with fluorescent material near a cathode ray tube that he was investigating started to glow when he turned the cathode ray tube on. When he covered the cathode ray tube with black paper, he was very surprised to see it had no effect on the glowing fluorescent material. But when he placed thick sheets of metal between the cathode ray tube and the fluorescent screen, the glowing stopped. So he knew that the radiation was absorbed by certain metals. He called this unknown radiation X-rays, X for unknown. Also in that year, a man named Henry Becquerel discovered that uranium ore released these same rays that were discovered by Rentgen. Furthermore, he discovered that there were at least two other forms of radiation different from X-rays that seemed to radiate from uranium ore. But he was distracted by other research and didn't put a lot of time into investigating these radiations. It was Rutherford who did the research to discover the nature of these new radiations that were coming from uranium. In 1898, during his last year at Cambridge, Rutherford set out to determine how well certain materials absorbed the radiation produced by uranium. The setup Rutherford used to conduct this experiment consisted of two metal plates as shown in the diagram here. The bottom plate was coated with a thin layer of uranium and the top plate was designed so that when the radiation from the uranium struck the top plate, it produced electrical current and the electrical current was directly proportional to the amount of radiation hitting it. He then placed successive layers of very thin aluminum foil over the uranium. When the first sheet of aluminum was added, 
Rutherford found that it diminished the radiation coming from the uranium by about 50%. And the same thing happened with the second and third sheets. Each one of those sheets absorbed about 50% of the radiation falling on it. But when he added the fourth sheet, he found that the radiation was only diminished by about 20%, and that continued for up to 12 sheets. This was an important discovery because not only did it confirm Becquerel's finding that there was more than one type of radiation coming from uranium, it also showed that one of the types of radiation was very easily absorbed by just a few thin layers of aluminum. Shortly after making this discovery, Rutherford was offered a position at McGill University of Montreal, Canada, where he continued his research on uranium and also on radium, which was a new element discovered by Madame Curie. At McGill, Rutherford set up an experiment which he could create a beam of radiation coming from uranium. He did it by putting the sample of uranium in a lead box with a hole in it. The lead absorbed the radiation in all directions except that through the hole. When negative and positive plates were placed on either side of the beam exiting the hole, Rutherford was amazed to find that it was comprised of at least three different types of radiation. One type was positive because it got attracted to the negative plate. Another type was negative because it got attracted to the positive plate. And a third type was not affected at all by the charged plates. Rutherford named these radiation types alpha, beta, and gamma. The negative beta beam shown in red here turned out to actually be electrons, the same electrons that J.J. Thompson discovered. The alpha beam shown in green here, the positive beam, actually turned out to be made of particles that were almost 8,000 times heavier than the electron. This was calculated by measuring the amount of deflection of the alpha beam compared to the beta beam. The alpha beam deflected very little compared to the electron beam. The gamma beam turned out to be not made of particles, but rather were comprised of electromagnetic waves, which we'll talk about later. It turned out that it was the alpha beam that was being stopped by just the three sheets of very thin aluminum. Alpha beams had almost no penetrating ability. In fact, it was discovered later that even thick paper could completely stop alpha particles if the paper was thick enough. And as shown in this diagram, beta particles can also be completely stopped by aluminum if the aluminum is thick enough. But the gamma rays go right through aluminum and can only be stopped by heavy metals such as lead. In 1908, Rutherford took a position as professor at the University of Manchester in England. And it was here that he did his experiments that led to the discovery of the nucleus. Rutherford had already determined that when a beam of alpha particles passed through thin sheets of metal foil, that the alpha beam actually spread out a bit or was diffused as it exited the metal. And he wanted to figure out if there was a connection between the thickness of the metal and the amount of diffusion. So in Manchester, he assigned two of his lab research assistants, Ernest Marsden and Hans Geiger, who invented the Geiger counter, to investigate this phenomenon of diffusion. They decided to use gold foil because it was so soft, it could be rolled into extremely thin sheets and they could make very slight changes in the thickness because of the ease of working with the gold. Here's a picture of the equipment that Marsden and Geiger used to detect the alpha particles. Here we see a piece of gold foil placed in the center of the apparatus with the source of alpha particles directly behind it. Rutherford used radioactive radium as a source of alpha particles. On the other side of the gold foil, we can see a microscope which has a scintillation screen attached to the end nearest the gold foil. A scintillation screen is a screen that glows or lights up every time even one alpha particle strikes it. So that by looking through the microscope, you could detect any time an alpha particle struck the scintillation screen. The cylinder to which the microscope was attached to could rotate 360 degrees around the gold foil, making it easy to measure the angle at which the alpha particle struck the screen. As expected, the alpha particle struck the scintillation screen and showed very little diffusion or spreading out. But as the microscope was rotated past the main beam, they were shocked to find that every once in a while, a slight scintillation was noticed many degrees away from the main bright spot. When these results were brought to Rutherford's attention, he directed the researchers to go back into the lab and make very accurate measurements of the angles and the frequencies at which the alpha particles were scattered. 
And after many months of data collection and years of mathematical analysis of the results, it was concluded that the only way that the alpha particles could be scattered at such great angles, even bouncing backwards on occasion, was if all of the positive part of the atom was concentrated in a very tiny space at the center of the atom. This new model explained why most of the positive alpha particles went right straight through the gold foil, because most of the atom was empty space. And when a positive alpha particle got near the positive nucleus of the atom, then it would deflect, since like charges repel. And if an alpha particle happened to hit the nucleus directly, the nucleus being the positive center, if an alpha particle hit it directly, it would bounce backwards, which is why when the microscope was turned behind the gold foil, occasionally they would see that an alpha particle actually went backwards. This made Thompson's plum pudding model obsolete and replaced it with a new model in which all of the positive part of the atom was located in a very tiny center we now call the nucleus of the atom. When units are ratios, there are three areas of frequent confusion that arise, and I want to go through these quickly before we go any further. The first is when the number one is not explicitly stated as part of the unit ratio. We're going to take a look at an example of this with speed in just a minute. The second area of confusion is when the label of the unit does not show that it's a ratio. For example, watt, which seems like it's describing a single entity, but it's actually describing a rate of joules per second. The last area of confusion is when the parts of the unit are not understood. So even if you know that a watt is a joule per second, if you don't understand what a joule is, then it's virtually impossible to grasp the full meaning of a watt. 